Hello GCSE students, this is the video that accompanies the reading of the introduction to Mali, the knocker, uh, and so on. Um, and in this one we're, I'm going to explain some of the things that Dickens appears to do in the text. Now the reading started from here, where it says now, and went down to the picture, which is here, and that's what we're going to focus on in this video. So what are we told? We're told that there's not really anything that unusual about the door knocker except it's large. That Scrooge had seen it every single day um, and not paid it the slightest bit of attention. Now the, perhaps the most interesting parts of this early, of this first paragraph we're looking at, is that we're told here that Scrooge had as little of what is called fancy about him as any man in the city of London. We're being told here that Scrooge is a rationalist. Um, and being a rational man, he believes in logic. He believes that there should be an explanation for everything that happens. Um, you could argue that potentially that makes the concept of religion uh, problematic, um, because arguably to some it's not necessarily the most rational way of viewing the world, and that has ramifications, that has an impact on the text, of course, because it's a Christmas carol. And at least in part, Christmas is about the celebration of Christ's birth. Um, so Scrooge is a man who doesn't have an imagination for um, the supernatural. And Dickens ensures that we understand the, the, sort of the seriousness of this and the, the extremity of how he is rational, because even in comparison to the corporation, the alderman and the livery, Scrooge is even more rational than, than they are. So who are the corporation, the alderman and the livery? And all I've done here is type in, as you can see, corporation, alderman, livery. So you can get an idea of to, what, what does this mean? So in the city of London, the corporation would be um, and the alderman and the livery. So they're, they're three slightly just separate things, but... These would be your rule makers, um, the mayor and um, his office and the people employed by the mayor to ensure that order is maintained and that rules are followed and that um, the standards of society are upheld. They are people who follow rules and laws to the letter. So Scrooge is seen as having less fancy, less imagination than even these people who uphold the law. So it's Dickens's way of making a, you know, slightly comic joke as well, but reinforcing that Scrooge is a man who is disinclined, not inclined, to believe in flights of fancy and the supernatural. And of course, that's what Marley will be. So that first paragraph tells us that it has become Marley's face. The knocker has become Marley's face. So again, using an image just to sort of push you in the right direction. There are so many versions of A Christmas Carol that have been made into films and animated shorts and all the rest that there's quite a lot to choose from here. But the whole point is that the door knocker changing into someone's face is a supernatural event. So at this particular part of the text, Dickens is seeking to establish that this is a ghost story, um, that we are to be terrified, that the terror that we feel is designed to lead to some process of change. And the change is initially for Scrooge, um, but Scrooge is representative. He is symbolic of other people like him, middle class um, men particularly perhaps of but people of wealth who have the ability to be kind and generous and benevolent towards others but make the choice to be something other than that then the second paragraph helps us to dickens is trying to um, push us towards where well, he's reminding us of the beginning of the text where whether and light are symbolic of Scrooge's isolation, how he is cut adrift from the rest of society. So Marley's face is 
not quite in the same amount of shadow as other parts of where Scrooge lives. So therefore, although it is a dismal light, it has a light about it. Um, and therefore, if light is symbolic of truth, then the ghost of Marley and the visitation of Marley will present a kind of truth, um, will present a kind of sight to Scrooge and enable him to hopefully go about changing. The supernatural elements of it are reinforced through how the hair is curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air. So we're just being told there that Marley's hair is sticking up on, on all ends and, and that would be a, a more terrifying vision for uh, Scrooge than, than if it were not. But that the eyes are motionless. And that's important because it is an attempt to unnerve Scrooge and unnerve the reader. It has a livid colour. We're not told what the colour is, but livid usually means angry, a violent, aggressive sort of colour, which makes it horrible. Um, but its horror seemed to be in spite of the face and beyond its control. And that's a really um, significant line, actually, a significant, significant phrase, because Marley doesn't have any control. Marley is forced to walk abroad. Um, because of the crimes of his his life while, while he was living it. And then when Scrooge looks back, it has become a knocker again. We're then told that Scrooge was, was terrified. You know, it was a something that his blood was not conscious of. He had been estranged from this feeling from, from birth. He'd never been as scared in his life before. But he goes inside anyway. He turns on his candle. We know that Scrooge is fearful because the narrator, who is not Dickens, but the narrator here is emphasising Scrooge's fear through the use of italics. He did pause before he shut the door. He did look behind the door first as if he was kind of expecting to see Marley sticking, you know, with his head sticking out in the back. Uh, but he wasn't there. There's nothing on the back of the door. And so Scrooge says, poo, 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 you know, pff, rubbish, nonsense, poppycock. He, and that reinforces his status as a rational thinking man. He closes the door with a bang. Boom. And the sound resounds through the house like thunder. So just in case it were not clear that Scrooge is to be scared, the description of Dickens is making it all the more apparent. Doors close with a bang, but they don't often resonate through the house. They don't often resound through the house. This one does. Every room above and every room below seems to have a separate boom, 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 boom sound. And we're, it's referred to as a peal of echoes. So a peal, usually if you have a peal of bells, I don't know, if you're at a wedding, something like that, um, you've, the bride and the groom have got married, they've got some bells ringing. It tends to be ding, 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 ding. And that's your peal of bells. In this instance, we've got a peal of echoes. Boom, 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 boom. So the supernatural elements of the story, the ghost the, sorry, the, the genre of the text as a ghost story uh, being really enforced and reinforced at this particular moment of the text. Scrooge, however, he's not scared of echoes. He shuts the door up the stairs and trims his candle. Nonsense, isn't it? That's what Scrooge would think, that this is humbug. Now, the next section of the text um, from here, you may talk vaguely about driving a coach and six other good old flights of stairs. Um, it, it serves a couple of functions. Perhaps the first function is that this paragraph uh, makes it clear that this is a very wide staircase. Um, 
I mean to say you might have got a hearse up that staircase and taken it broadwise and done it easy. It's a, it's a very grand staircase. It's an impressive building that Scrooge lives in. Um, and that helps to re-establish his material wealth. He's got money and uh, he, he can use it. There was plenty of width for that and room to spare, which is perhaps the reason why Scrooge thought he saw a locomotive hearse. A hearse is typically the name given to a vehicle that carries you know, carries the, a dead body, carries the dead on their way to a funeral. Um, but it's a locomotive, which we know is a train. And so we have this supernatural atmosphere again being accentuated through the vision of a, you know, it's a night train, it's a ghost train, proceeding up and down, up and down his stairs. Scrooge, however, is a rational man. It's perhaps the reason why he thinks he sees it, but note the words here like perhaps, it, uh, it's so vague, um, He's not inclined to pay any attention, pay any credence. He's not inclined to believe it. Scrooge carries on up the stairs. Darkness is cheap and Scrooge liked it. It's a nice line. Um, because it helps to, again, reinforce, to accentuate how the motif of light is used throughout the text. Scrooge lives in the dark. He literally lives in the dark because the room is dark, but he metaphorically lives in the dark as well because of his isolation, because of his selfishness and um, his miserliness. Perhaps the same word means the same thing in many respects, but um, you can use miser for selfish, miserly for selfish. Um, and then he goes to his room. Now we know that Scrooge is a rational man, I've said that a number of times, but he's still fearful that there's a sense that Dickens wants us to see that, well, he, he is unnerved, and that's through this, this next paragraph. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet, nobody in his dressing gown. So, the repetition of nobody creates a sense of scale, but it, more than anything, Scrooge must have checked that there was nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Uh, my favourite of them is this uh, nobody in his dressing gown, which was hanging up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. Um, and the reason I like it is it's the word attitude. The dressing gown is personified there um, through the word attitude. It's not hanging up in a suspicious manner, but the dressing gown has an attitude. Um, it's, just, it's vaguely comic. And so, all the way throughout the text, whenever there is a rather serious, ghostly message being promoted, Dickens will typically offset it with um, some light comedy. Um, do we laugh out loud? Perhaps not. But it, he's just trying to ensure that we're taking on board the message of the text, which is about change. It's not about fear. Um, and perhaps a good way to con conceptualise that and to contextualise it, I should say, is you're all young people. Some of you might not act in ways that uh, you're always supposed to. Do, does a threat work? Does fear make you comply? Well, it might do, but does it encourage compliance in a way which um, fosters resentment? Yes, I think it does. Do we enjoy being fearful? No, we don't. Um, compliance is best achieved and getting people to do what you want is best achieved with politeness and encouragement, not fear. So there's no point Dickens saying that we must be scared into change. 
we have to want to change we have to want to take personal responsibility and that's why i think we have this balance between the ghost story which does seek to strike some fear but then that being offset with some comedy because fear on its own uh, wouldn't last it wouldn't be permanent right as we move on scrooge is quite satisfied but he double locks himself in which is not his custom so we know that he is unnerved a word i'll repeat and, and then he gets changed and gets ready for bed even in his own house scrooge has a very low fire indeed so even in his own place of residence he doesn't put more than you know one coal on the fire um, his earlier treatment of bob cratchit allowing him only one coal is therefore at least consistent um, Maybe it, maybe it makes, seem, makes Scrooge seem a less cruel character because he is cruel to himself. His consistency means that he doesn't personalise the issue. He doesn't have a problem with Bob Cratchit per se. He is just miserly through and through. But it tells us a great deal about his character that he was obliged to sit close to to the fire because he had so little of it and he had to sit virtually you know over it in order to get any kind of warmth from it then the next section of the text is about how around the fireplace are some tiles which illustrate the scriptures the scriptures being um, the bible and so we have here Cain's and Abel's Pharaoh's daughters, queens of Sheba, um, angelic messengers, um, Abraham, Belshazzar's apostles. And so the, the whole purpose of this is so we can see that Scrooge is being stared in the face each and every single day by religious messages which promote tolerance, love, forbearance, benevolence, kindness. Scrooge is looking at that every single day and he is making the conscious choice to ignore it. These are also examples of biblical allusions and I'm just going to focus on one of them because the rest of them you can go and look them up. Um, you, know, you go to Google, you open up a new page, you type in Queen of Sheba, you, you see what comes up. But the most straightforward one of them uh, is that of Cain and Abel. In the book of Genesis, you will have perhaps heard of that, but if you haven't, in the book of Genesis, the, there are two main characters who are introduced, at the beginning anyway. Uh, and in the beginning, they are um, Adam and Eve. After Eve takes the apple, takes the fruit of off of the tree of knowledge um, she and adam are condemned by god to you know, to work effectively and to, to live in sin and they are the creators of original sin um, in that in in the bible in the parable of um, the story of adam and eve and the garden of eden well anyway long-winded way of getting to the story that their two children are brothers Cain and Abel and in the story of Cain and Abel there is a very famous line which is am I my brother's keeper am I my brother's keeper because Cain and Abel these days if we were to make reference to them in a story um, and as Dickens has done is telling the reader here that Scrooge is looking at a message He's looking at a tile, sorry, which promotes a message of, am I my brother's keeper? Is it my responsibility to care for my brother and ensure that he is happy and that he lives comfortably? Or should I just leave him to suffer? Now, Cain and Abel in the story of Genesis, in the book of Genesis, they were actual brothers. But, but that doesn't really matter in um, Christianity in most religions it doesn't really matter at all 
because we live in a, a great big brotherhood. Um, we are all the same. We are all part of one society. Um, we are all part of a community. Am I my brother's keeper? Could be the neighbour. It could be the bloke who lives ten doors down. It could be the person who lives in Hartford or in Herefordshire. It doesn't really matter. But do we allow other people to suffer? Um, now, as I'm doing the video today, um, it's Sunday the 31st of May. Uh, in the news are is sorry in the news is lots of in the news are many stories of what's going on in America um, in Minneapolis, where police officers have been accused, but certainly appear let's use tentative language appear to be responsible for the death of a black man, and this is leading to rioting in America and. Um, the deployment of the National Guard um, and you can see that there is not much brotherhood around whether you're black white blue yellow pink um, it doesn't really matter what color you are are you your brother's keeper um, so and I think that's why texts like a Christmas Carol remain relevant is because the message of brotherhood and fraternity means the same thing brotherhood fraternity but the message of community, togetherness, being your brother's keeper, looking out for others, it doesn't really go away. Anyway, we move on. I will ask that you look up Abraham, Belshazzar, Apostles. But yes, and that, yeah, that face, Marley, seven years dead, came like the ancient prophet's rod and swallowed up the whole. So Scrooge is being, his thoughts are focused exclusively on that of Marley as a consequence of what he has seen what he has seen on the door knocker if each smooth tile had been a blank at first with power to shape some picture on its surface from the disjointed fragments of his thoughts there would have been a copy of old Marley's head on every one so those tiles which he had looked at and had been on his fireplace for many a year that he had never paid any attention, that he had never paid any attention to or taken any attention um, of, well now they have become relevant because he is imagining Marley's head on every single one. Not that he chooses to believe it because he says humbug. Nonsense. After several turns, he sits down again. So we know again that he is unnerved. He's pacing, you know, walking round and around his room. And then we have the bells. Those bells. Now, Scrooge is living in um, the city of London. Um, Cornhill is a street that was referenced earlier in the text. And by typing City of London Cornhill in, you, you get a feel for, well, where is he living? Um, he's living not far from Liverpool Street Station. Those of you who've been to London will perhaps um, be able to make a connection there. Um, this is sort of near Bank, the Tube Station Bank. Um, and these are the kinds of buildings that if you've been up to London and, and that particular part of it that you would have seen. These days, they're predominantly office blocks. And we're being told that in the text, even now they are pretty much office blocks. So Scrooge is anomalous. He is an anomaly. He is the odd one out in, in living in a building such as this. Um, he lives there because it's his place of work uh, as well, and it's a way of saving money. But these are the kinds of buildings there where uh, you would have had bells because if I'm the lord of the the lord of the house and I want my servant to go and do something for me, I ring my bell from downstairs, it rings upstairs, or vice versa, and and then you know, the servant will come and do my bidding, do as I want them to. Um, so yeah, bells. If any of you have ever been to um, the Hertfordshire golf course, there's a spa and a and a gym as well. Some of you will have been or. Um, you at least know where it is, perhaps. Not not far from Broxbourne School. Um, 
and you go into the bar area perhaps because you played a round of golf and you've decided to sit down and have a nice glass of squash or something like that, then um, you'll see bells. There'll be bells there um, because obviously it's a rather grand country house, or at least it was once upon a time. And the bells are still there to signify. Well, they're just gonna, they lend. They tell us something about the history of the place um, as it once was. Anyway, we move on once more. The main point about the bells is that they ring. And again, the supernatural elements of the story are being reinforced. Scrooge is sat in a room. It's perfectly silent. He's double locked it. It's dark with only a, a meagre light from the fire. And out of nowhere, there are bells ringing. All of the bells in the house start to ring as well. It was with great astonishment and with a strange, inexplicable dread that as he looked, he saw this bell begin to swing. It scarcely made a sound, but soon it rang out loudly and so did every bell in the house. What's the purpose of a bell? It might be an alarm. Scrooge needs waking up metaphorically. It could be a kind of siren, like a police. Um, you know, police use a bell of sorts, it's a siren, um, to denote that there's warning, um, danger, move aside, stop. Um, bells, as I alluded to earlier, are rung at weddings as a form of celebration. But for Scrooge, the bell is more funereal. Bells are also rung at funerals. Um, they are sometimes symbolic of death. And with the bells ringing, perhaps we're being told that there is the arrival of death. Marley is dead, if nothing else. But I think that there's probably a combination of all of those sorts of things. Um, Scrooge is about to receive a warning from a ghost. And as such, the bells are ringing out loudly, all of the bells in the house ringing out loudly to stress the importance of what is to come. Then the bells ceased as they had begun together. So bells ring, then bells stop. I mean, just, just picture that. If you're in your house and bells ring and then they stop out of nowhere, I, th I think we're likely to be scared. Your house probably doesn't have bells in it, which would make it all the more terrifying, perhaps, but there we are. Um, they were then succeeded by a clanking noise. Dum! 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 So we've got this kind of loud, crashing clank uh, uh, you know, out of nowhere. As if some person were dragging a heavy chain over the casks downstairs in the wine merchant's cellar. So a cask is just a, you know, another name for a barrel. But dragging a heavy chain. Like I don't know how I can make a, a chain sound where I am right now. But you know, I, th I think I can leave you to imagine that. Hopefully you're not as rational as Scrooge. But he's dragging his chain with him. Or there is a chain being dragged. And then the sound of something dropped. The chain dropped onto the ground. Scrooge then remembered to have heard that ghosts in haunted houses were described as dragging chains. And that's our first clue, really, that Scrooge is aware of a ghost. He, that's the first time Scrooge cottons on to a ghost um, being with him. Boom! The cellar door flies open. Just in case Scrooge wasn't scared, bells, clanking, heavy drop sounds. Door flies open, crashes open, and then eventually emerges a ghost coming up the stairs. That noise arriving to him. Scrooge still doesn't believe it, but the most important line, I think the lot, the most important word, I won't believe it. Even when Scrooge is being stared in the face with the arrival of a ghost, his refusal 
to acknowledge change. To, 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 yeah, it, it's staggering. We are just supposed to see him as a obstinate, as an obstinate, difficult man who, whose um, opinions will not be changed any longer. His colour changed, though, when, without a pause, it came on through the heavy door and passed into the room before his eyes. Upon its coming in, you'll notice I'm highlighting the word it and its, the dying flame leaped up, hellish-like, as though it cried, I know him, Marley's ghost, and fell again. And I'm highlighting the word it because it is Dickens's way of establishing that this is no human uh, appearing before him. It defies description. It is always such a vague word. Um, and it's dehumanising. It dehumanises a ghost. You could argue, well, that's obvious enough. It's a ghost. But if we put those two ideas together, that the ghost and its appearance initially, at least, defies description so that the word it is the only one that will suffice. And secondly, that it dehumanises. Um, then we've got an, a, sort of a reasonably strong interpretation, I think, of the first impressions that Scrooge and the reader are supposed to have. Um, and I think that's it on this particular section. There's you know, quite a lot going on, um, but there has to be, doesn't there? Why does there have to be? The text is only about 120 pages long, and um, therefore we'll find that not many of the characters are fleshed out. They're not characterised in any huge amount of detail. Even Scrooge, He's just a kind of a bad apple who changes. Um, we don't know, we don't learn huge amounts about him throughout the text. It's all just hinted at. And the rest of the characters, that's even more the case. And therefore, Dickens is more focused on conveying strong, strong emotions at the beginning of the text uh, and throughout the text, of course, so that his message is all the more apparent that change is required. And as we move on into the next section, then um, we're going to see a conversation between Scrooge and Marley, where we will see Scrooge's disbelief and also his reticence, his, his desire to not see and not hear what Marley has to say. And Marley's desire to give Scrooge a chance to change and to learn from his mistakes, to learn from Marley's mistakes so that he doesn't suffer the same fate. But that conversation is less powerful unless Scrooge is on the back foot. And this paragraph and this, this section that we've looked at in this video is Dickens's attempt, I think, to establish Scrooge as fearful, to Scrooge is unnerved, Scrooge is on that back foot, because otherwise there is no chance of his um, evolution, revolution, his change in character. That's it for now. Hope it makes sense. There will be questions um, attached to this as well. Um, try your best with those and look out for the next video as well. Thanks very much.